Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 630 of the podcast and it is Friday the 24th of June 2022 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to crime author Claire McIntosh about writing twists, how her experience in the police informs her writing now and also about book marketing as a traditionally published author. Claire is incredibly savvy about business and book marketing and doesn't just leave it to her publisher to get her books into readers' hands. So we talk about what she does versus her publisher, how she reframes marketing and much more. So that is coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news, well, some really interesting news on intellectual property rights this week. If you've been watching Stranger Things, you'll know Kate Bush's song, Running Up That Hill, features prominently and has now hit the charts 37 years after release, which I mentioned a week or so ago. But there is now an article in Music Business Worldwide, which goes into the details, reporting that Kate Bush is the world's biggest independent artist right now, as she owns all the rights rights to the song Running Up That Hill. She owns the entire recording copyright to that song as well as the Hounds of Love album and the rest of her biggest hits. The hits are distributed by Warner Music Group but they are owned by Kate Bush. They're not even credited as being licensed to anyone. Uh, So they say, so this is Music Business Worldwide. It's a really great article. I'll link to it in the show notes. It says, uh, an educated guess, Kate Bush will be making the majority, perhaps even as much as 80% plus, if she's on a basic distribution deal of the recorded music royalties generated by her masters right now. Last week, Running Up That Hill did 57 million chart-eligible global streams on Spotify alone. That would, at rough industry estimates, translate to over $200,000 in recorded music royalties from one platform in one format, streaming, in one week. Her company, Noble and Bright Limited, a company she owns 100%, and which, according to the UK company's house, had £2.37 million in cash on its balance sheet at the close of May 2021, which was um, when the last reporting was done. So the article is really interesting. It goes into numbers for quite a lot of different names. And they talk also about Queen. It says Queen own their recordings catalogue worldwide outside of North America via Queen Productions Limited. Queen licensed their recordings to Universal Music Group for most of the world, but the band and Freddie Mercury's estate own the underlying copyrights. If Queen was ever to sell those underlying copyrights, music business worldwide estimated last year, especially if they'd included publishing rights, we could be looking at music's first billion dollar plus single artist catalogue acquisition story. So uh, the the article digs around under the hood of these businesses and they say, You will find that the historical tale of superstar artists being owned by and indentured to major record companies is fast becoming a nonsensical story in 2022. These superstar artists are running independent businesses that hold tens of millions of dollars in cash. They own the underlying rights. Increasingly, the major record companies have to prove their worth and global value add to successful artists, not the other way around. That's how the balance of power should have looked back in 1985 when Kate Bush first had a top five hit with Running Up That Hill. And they close the article by saying how satisfying it must be for her in 2022 as she soars to number one all over the globe to know that she not only wrote, performed and produced this evergreen classic, but that today it's all hers and no one can take it from her. And I thought that was a great article. I mean, obviously, we don't want to wait 37 years for the big money. But I think what's so interesting about this article, and again, please have a look at it because the music industry is always uh, ahead of the book industry. But 
much of the digital side of things is is similar. But it's really interesting that these longer term artists and perhaps again, contracts back then were different and contracts that newer artists sign now are more difficult to opt out of these various clauses. But this longer term view of IP, I think, is what we have to keep in mind. And on the same topic, Christine Catherine Rush has an article about managing your intellectual property for the long term, where she says, protect your assets. Yeah, they might not be worth a lot in 2022. But what about 2050, 2070? You have no idea if something will take off and become successful in the future. Bet on yourself. Believe that your work will be worth something in that future and protect the work now. If you don't, no one else will. And Chris has a book on this called Rethinking the Writing Business. And I'm also listening to an audio book, uh, 24 Assets by Daniel Priestley uh, on, uh, on audio. And it looks at the different kinds of assets you need in your business. Fundamentally, income follows assets. And intellectual property assets are, of course, the core of what we do as writers. And of course, in the interview today, Claire McIntosh, we have a talk about this. And, you know, she's very keen on being traditionally published. Um, But again, it's still about licensing your IP. So you get to choose how you license your IP. But I just think this is fascinating. I love this Kate Bush story. Um, And of course, I I really enjoy Stranger Things in this particular. uh, the, The way this is tied to an emotional moment is so is what is making it a hit. It's it's the emotion behind what they did with the song as well. So in Futurist Stuff, I hope you found the in between episode interesting with Andrew Main last week. And there have been uh, some other developments this week. I just thought I'd mention this one. Cosmopolitan magazine used a cover generated by Doll E by OpenAI, which Andrew and I talked about in the interview last week. Basically, these models generate images from text. And this is what I used for the NFTs that I also put on OpenSea, uh, I have generated images from words of my novels, essentially. So this article um, about Cosmopolitan is, and it's on the Cosmopolitan site, again, links in the show notes. The article about the process is insightful because you can see how they played with different prompts um, because the machine doesn't have a will of its own to create. It's not like, hey, create a cover, just create a cover. They, it needs more than that. <laughs> you have to drive it with your creative vision. And they actually did work with an artist who drove the machine. Now, this is exactly what Andrew and I talked about in the last episode. Creatives who engage with these tools can use them to amplify our creative direction. And of course, those who learn the tools are going to be better positioned as these tools become more and more common. But it's definitely easier to see this kind of generation and amplification with images as they are so fast. So again, we'll link to that in the show notes. The Cosmo article ends with... The results are shockingly good, which is why, since its limited release in April, Doll E2 has inspired both awe and trepidation from the people who have seen what it can do. And my answer, as ever, with Andrew, (laughs) as we talked about, is to engage with the tools and use them ethically in your creative process. And of course, more in my course, the AI-assisted author, thecreativepen.com forward slash learn. In my personal update, I am recording the audiobook for how to write a novel, which I have to do in batches as it's pretty intense here in my little recording box and it has been quite hot. So I tend to do it early, then edit the audio and then get it together for mastering. And so it's definitely a bit of a process. I also just got like literally just before I started recording, I got the first copy of the paperback of how to write a novel from Book Vault, which is what I'm going to use for my uh, print on demand from my Shopify store. And the quality is really good. Uh, Really, I'm so impressed. And it also has a title, a title page in colour, which won't be in the KDP print and Ingram edition. So I think it makes it that little bit more special. So I'm just proofing it and getting the large print hardbacks, doing the workbook, a lot of finishing energy, as well as building my Shopify store and uh, getting ready for the launch. I'm aiming for the week of 11th of July. That's my plan. So uh, how to write a novel will be there as well as everything else. And the timing is good as Shopify have just announced a whole load of new features, including social commerce integration with Twitter, which of course is my favourite social media platform. So I'm really excited about getting all this done 
And although it's quite painful because I have so many books in so many formats and I am going to go live with not everything, <laughs> it will be a smaller selection because it's just a lot of work to set it all up and test it all. So, uh, but I'm very, very excited. Like it feels, as Katie Cross said, it feels so positive and I feel almost reinvigorated around the idea of marketing direct to my store because I'll take a bigger slice of the pie and it's going to make so many things more effective. Uh, With inflation and the cost of living, we all need a bigger slice of the pie. (laughs) I think you can agree with me. So as this goes out, I will be in London for some meetings and then I'm speaking at Self Publishing Show Live on the creator economy, where I will indeed wax lyrical on these things and talk about this vision of how we as authors can recenter ourselves rather than putting the publishers or the retailers in the middle of our businesses and be more Kate Bush. I think maybe that's going to be my phrase. Be more Kate Bush, be more independent. Uh, so yes, I've only got an hour for that talk. And of course, by the time I walk on stage, walk off, probably be about 50, 50 or so minutes. And uh, of course, I did four and a half hours on it the other week. And I'm going to be expanding my material for a course that I'm putting together on the creator economy for authors. And that will be out in probably mid August. Uh, So lots going on. I've so much to share at the moment. I feel amazing. I guess I've been learning a lot. But uh, yeah, I'm reinvigorated with what I've got to share, which is um, I hope will be useful for you too. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Uh, Lots of people saying how much they love the episode with Katie Cross and lots of you doing your own direct sales in different ways, which is really encouraging. James Felix said, this episode was mind blowing. I forgot my dog Rue was even with me. (laughs) I need to listen again to fully appreciate all the the detail like a crash course in self-publishing. Also, many of you emailed mentioning WooCommerce, which is, of course, another option. You With WooCommerce, you can use plugins on an existing WordPress site. Now, of course, I'm, I have WordPress sites, but the main reason I didn't go that way is that the creativepen.com is so old. <laughs> I started it in 2008 and the thought of adding any more plugins is too painful, <laughs> believe me. So I wanted a fresh site. I wanted to kind of start again. I will probably be putting content marketing on the store site itself and I want to kind of curate that and not have years and years of backlist stuff that is difficult to trawl through. So, uh, but yeah, WooCommerce has much the same functionality, much the same integrations. And in fact, my friend Orna Ross uses WooCommerce on her site, ornaross.com, for her poetry and her other books. Uh, So you can have a look at that if you want to. So there are pros and cons with every service as ever. You have to choose what works best for you. Just a couple of other, oh, lots of people sent me pictures this week, which is awesome. T.A. Creech said, listening while doing laundry at dawn. Lovely picture of palm trees and a sunrise. Kirsten Lillis said, oh, I was listening to the episode with Tammy Lebrecht while walking my dog and enjoying the view of Long Peaks, Colorado, USA. Uh, I bought Newsletter Ninja and flew through it. I've never been so motivated to work on my email list. P.S. Podcasts sell books. Oh, yes, they do. And finally, Carmen Spiljak says, listening to the podcast on my daily walk in the nearby park, a.k.a. Atlantic Rainforest and Avenida Paulista. It's even warm today. Thank you so much. And remember, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen with a double N. Send me pictures of where you're listening or email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. Leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Draft to Digital, and I will play a word from Kevin Tumlinson in a minute. And I just wanted to remind you that you can find the Self-Publishing Insiders podcast brought to you by Kevin and the Draft to Digital team wherever you're listening to this show. Recent episodes have included From Concept to Book in One Week, What Does SIFWA Offer Authors, that's the uh, Science Fiction Writers Association, something like that. And self-publishing industry insights based on sales data with Mark Leslie Lefebvre. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show, especially the in-between episodes, is sponsored by my patrons. 
Thanks to new patron this week, Mark22. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for months and years. You're all amazing. And of course, I sent out the Q&A for patrons this week when I answer questions, whatever you want, on uh, pretty much everything related to writing and marketing and publishing and future and personal things. So you can support the show and get get the Q&A at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. And I know that some people don't want to contribute monthly, but occasionally you can always buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, I'll play a word from Draft to Digital and then we'll get on with the interview. Hi, this is Kevin Tomlinson with Draft to Digital bringing you DDD smart author tip number 12. Book promotions. Yeah, you heard me. Reaching more readers worldwide on every ebook retailer online is one of the biggest challenges you face as an indie author. And D2D is all about giving you the tools you need to meet all of your self publishing challenges. That's why we've been building a whole set of tools for you, all aimed at helping you reach more readers in more places to increase discoverability for yourself and for your books. From author pages to book tabs, reading lists to scheduled promotions, we've built a whole toolbox to help you with your marketing. And we aren't stopping there. We're actively talking to our retailers to find as many promos as we can and passing them on to you. And as we go, we grow. Building more author marketing tools is part of our mission. Draft to Digital. We are self-publishing with support. Find more at d2d.tips slash creative pen. That's pen with two N's because we're big on the numeral two around here. Claire McIntosh is the multi-award winning author of five Sunday Times bestselling novels. Translated into 40 languages, her books have sold more than 2 million copies worldwide and have been New York Times and international bestsellers. Her latest book, The Last Party, is the first in a new crime series. So welcome, Claire. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. I have always been a storyteller, always written short stories, written little snippets, pen pictures of of characters, always a voracious reader. But like a lot of people, didn't ever see as a child that there was a potential career here. You know, I, I enjoyed writing, but it wasn't something I saw as a, as a job possibility. I didn't know anybody who was who worked in the arts, who produced music or or poetry or anything. I just knew people who worked in jobs. And so I went to university. I did French and business at university, and then in a slight plot twist, I joined the police. And spent 12 years in the police. But, you know, I I say this a lot because people think that it's such a a different career being in the the police to writing novels. But there are so many similarities between the two careers. When you are a detective, you're a storyteller, you're having to write a witness statement for someone, a statement for someone who's been a victim of crime. You have this immense responsibility to find exactly the right words to put across what's happened to this person. And victims don't start with a a beginning and then a middle and an end. You know, they, they start with the end. They start by telling you they've been attacked or they've been burgled. And then you have to pull them back and, and work out what was their origin story and how did those events lead to where you are now? So it's all about storytelling, pulling out the narrative that the cameras have got to tell you and the forensics and all the unreliable witnesses all over the place. And then presenting that story in a in a compelling way to an audience, to a court. And that's exactly what we do now as, as writers. So it felt like a weirdly natural progression to go from stories that dealt with fact to stories that are fictional. Mm. So how does your background then in the police weave its way into your fiction? Because you've obviously got lots of books now. Uh, Are they all based uh, out of your experience or or how does it weave in? They're they're hardly ever based on real life or or at least not on real life cases. I think people perhaps have an idea that ex-police officers have this huge bank of stories that they could fictionalize. And and maybe some officers do. My experience of crimes is that 
in for the most part they're really quite boring and criminals are really quite stupid and so the idea of these sort of criminal masterminds that we see in bond films or in crime novels is is really quite unusual it's quite rare but what being a police officer taught me that that I put into all my books is it is about people it's about really understanding people and coming into contact with people from all walks of life that really meant I am able to write with a degree of authenticity about people outside my own lived experience, outside my sort of comfortable bubble that I grew up in. And I think what it also did was it showed me how fine that line is between a safe life and an unsafe life, how how easily we can cross over from witness to victim to offender and and back again. And that's that grey area is what I I and lots of other thriller writers like to write about. Mm. But then I guess you chose the, mainly the crime genre, crime thriller genre. I know you've written some other things like memoir, but why did you go that way? Did you just not want to leave it behind or do you just love crime? I I mean, I do love crime and I grew up really reading crime and my, my sort of first great loves were the, the famous five books. And although people sort of put them in a children's book genre. They are, of course, crime novels. They're about kids being playing detective. So I grew up reading crime. But actually, when I wrote I Let You Go, which was my debut, I didn't know what genre it was going to be, which seems odd for anyone who's who's read it because it is about a, a hit and run. And so it's probably fairly obvious that it's a crime. But stories can take lots of different angles. And when I first wrote that book, I was really focusing on a woman who had been through this this terrible trauma. There'd there'd been a hit and run in which a a child had been killed. And the focus of the novel was how how do we move on from that? How do you deal with trauma and grief in in your past life and build a new future? And that's a story which could spin off in lots of different directions and hit lots of different genres. And the one that it ended up in happened to be the psychological thriller genre. And as you'll know, once you write one book in a genre, you kind of need to keep going because that's what readers expect. Absolutely. And uh, I Let You Go, I I feel, is quite famous for its twist and no spoilers, obviously, but you do write twists. And I've also seen your plotting methods (laughs) on your various videos and blog posts and things. So tell us, how do you plot and write twists? really hard (laughs) I'm glad you said that because I'm like oh my goodness you just seem to do them (laughs) I am yeah I find find it really hard and that one of the things I really want to say because I think it's really important for people listening at home who perhaps are struggling with the pressure of putting twists in their works in progress is that you do not have to have a twist. And so often when I see that a book has an incredible twist actually what it's got is a really good reveal and and so actually understanding the difference between a twist and a reveal is quite an important thing to do and then take the pressure off yourself because you do need to have reveals, ideally more than one, but you don't have to have a twist. So the first thing that I do is work out, is this a book which needs reveals or is it a book which wants a twist and, and can I think of a, a good one to go in it? And sometimes the book starts with a twist and in, in the case of I let you go in the case of let me lie. The twist is what came first. In other other times, it's the other way around and it's the situation. So my most recent thriller hostage is set on a, an aeroplane, set on a, a nonstop 20 hour flight. And, and there is actually a twist in it, as it turns out, but it didn't start with a twist. It started with a situation. It started with a locked room thriller in an aeroplane. And that was a case of plotting the novel, writing the novel, and then realising that there was an opportunity to pull the rug out from people's um, feet. So what I do is I I plot my novels out and I plot them out in in pretty forensic detail. I feel like if I was an architect, I, I wouldn't be able to build a house without knowing what the plans were. So that's how I start off with my three act structure, gradually adding more meat onto the bone. Um, uh, I'm just mixing my metaphors horribly now. <laughs> Houses, bones, <laughs> gardening, all sorts. Um, so I, I'm adding and adding and adding until I end up with a chapter outline. 
And at this point, I add, so if you kind of can imagine a, a table or a spreadsheet, and I know that there'll be people at home, in fact, including you probably going, but you can use Scrivener for that. <laughs> and you can, it's just not my bag. So mm-hmm. I like a nice old fashioned word table once I've moved on from my post-it notes. And I have a column against my chapters, which is called the reader's journey. And this is where I play God. This is where I manipulate my readers, where I decide how I want them to feel and what I want them to think at every stage of this book. And that's re- a really important part of my, my twist building because it, it means I can say, okay, in this chapter, you think A did it and you know B is really nice. And in this chapter, you now realize B isn't nice because of what they've done there, but now you don't trust C. And I make sure that that I'm kind of giving my reader whiplash, I suppose, right the way through. And only once I've done all of that do I start writing. I think that's fantastic. I love that. The reader's emotional journey there. I'm more of an intuitive writer. I don't do any plotting. <laughs> I just sit down and write and stuff happens. And if it surprises me, then I hope it surprises the reader. But I, I think the, you know, that that's two we're two extremes, I think, there. We are the, the plotter and the pantser. So that's that's in although I say discovery writer. I, I don't like the, the pantser word. No, but, I actually refuse to use that word because <laughs> Oh, it's American, I, isn't it? It's, well, it's not just that. I, it's a really sort of flippant term for what is a professional process. You know, whether you're writing for money, whether you write as a hobbyist, whether you are published or not. Actually, we are really serious about our writing and calling someone a pantser. I just, I, yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, I don't. I, I use discovery writer. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's that's fantastic. The the reader's journey. You, you did. We should just be clear. You said the difference between a twist and a reveal. Could you just define those two? Yeah. So my definition is that a a reveal is the answer to a question that the reader has been asking. So uh, an example of that is who killed the victim? And a twist is an answer to a question that the reader hadn't even thought to ask. Mm. So you totally change their, their world by presenting them with something unexpected. Mm. I think that that reveal, as you say, has to be in every book. We have to open questions and then answer questions. That's that's basically what we have to do. But yeah, the twist, as you say, doesn't have to be in everything. But yeah, you do them so well. So I did. Uh, let's move into marketing. And it's interesting. You did French and business at university because I see having watched you now for, I don't know, almost, I guess, seven, eight years. You're very good at business. And let's talk about marketing because marketing is something that a lot of indie authors know they have to do. But I feel like traditionally published authors often just want someone else to do it. So why do you think marketing is so important even for traditionally published authors? Because marketing is important to book publishing and you can't kind of opt out of that. If you want people to read your books, then they have to be marketed. So then it comes down to who is doing the, the marketing. And yes, of course, if, if you're with a, a large traditional publisher, then you will have a marketing team. But an author's expectations can be really dashed by assuming that that marketing team is going to do everything because budgets are different and publishers have different sizes. And regardless of the size of a team, they have lots of other books to market as well. So I, you know, I'm really lucky. I have an incredible in-house team and they work really, really hard on my books, but I'm not their only author, although sometimes it feels like it and I'm in awe of how they manage to juggle all their different projects. So A, they will be focusing on my books at a particular time of the year whereas I want to keep a a year-round overview. But also the best person to market your books is yourself because you know your products, you know your your books inside out. You're the one that will spot an opportunity for marketing, for advertising, for, for PR, and be able to leap on it really quickly. So for me, the perfect approach is, is a kind of hybrid approach whereby I assume the role of CEO of, of my author business and, and I have my kind of my mini departments within my own world. But then I'm also working with my publisher and, and their setup and we all work together. So I have, so now I have freelancers I work with um, because this year I just reached a point, this year, end of last year, just reached a point where I, I just couldn't couldn't do it all. And I don't find it easy to let go at all. 
So that's been quite a long time coming and it's well overdue. <laughs> uh, so I have a team of freelancers and they work directly now with my in-house team. So this is my kind of next step is that I get to move slightly away from it, which uh, is, a, is a work in progress. Wow, that's brilliant. And I definitely remember hiring those first people and just feeling like, "Mm, is it going to be worth it? I could just do it better myself. (laughs) And then going, no, stop it. (laughs) It's a hard thing. You know, I constantly repeat to myself, just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to. And that's sometimes that's about ability. Sometimes it's about time. Sometimes it's, it's just not the right thing to do. You don't have to do every project you think of. So yeah, work in progress. Yeah. Well, just coming back to, I mean, you mentioned there the author's expectations. And I I feel that a lot of the most disappointed traditionally published authors are the ones who thought that the publisher would do all the marketing and then they didn't. But it seems like you have very, from the very beginning, sort of taken on like, yes, I'm part of the marketing team, which is, it's just a very different attitude. But I guess you mentioned there, the time of year is different as in they might do things at launch, but you have year round. But what types of things do you split between the publisher and yourself? So probably social media is one of the best examples of that, because actually that is split three ways. And uh, I guess if you're if you were particularly interested, you could go and look at, say, my Instagram feed and think, "Ha, huh, I wonder which of these posts was made by Claire herself and which was briefed by Claire, but written by someone else and which was written by Claire, but scheduled by someone else. The, the, the upshot is it's a real mixture. So my publisher's may well lead on things like um, there's a book bub, there's an audible deal, a countdown to release, producing assets for that. My freelance team will lead on book club stuff. So I run my mailing list. Well, I run a book club instead of an author mailing list. My freelancers will lead on that and update my social media feed with what book we're reading and various other things. And then I will lead on my personal life. So my personal book recommendations, my personal writing tips, my personal behind the scenes, what I'm doing. And that's an approach which for me works really well. And I've tried someone else doing everything and it doesn't work for me because I feel out of control, but more importantly, I feel out of touch with my readers and I just can't do that. I don't see the point of being on social media if I'm not able to interact and and chat to readers. So the perfect balance for me is, is that mixture. You mentioned email list there and and you have a book club, but they, you do have an email list yourself, right? You do email those people who are in your book club. And we actually recently did a a promotion, an email list promotion. And what I've always been a bit surprised about, I think, is um, traditionally published authors who don't have any email list and indies as well. Like there's people listening who have not still started their email list because either they don't want to, they don't want to manage email or they think nobody wants to hear from them or they think the publishers should do it. So why is an email list so important to you, even though you're trad published? Oh, I mean, how long have you got? It is <laughs> so, <laughs> so important. You know, go, go and start your mailing list. The So, so email remains the most effective form of, of communication. More people will open their email than they will see a, a social media post because you are landing in their inbox. It's like being invited through the front door instead of standing on their front lawn, waving through the window and hoping they'll see you. The conversion rate is much better. The relationship that you're building feels more one-to-one. You have complete control over your mailing list. So Meta can decide to take down Facebook or Instagram. It can change algorithms so that your posts aren't being shown to people in the same way. They can start charging. They can do a myriad of things. And you don't control that, that data, those people who follow you there. But you do control your mailing list. And so it remains the most valuable part of your marketing real estate. And I'm always horrified when people don't have mailing lists. And I'm really horrified when authors let their publishers run their mailing lists for them. 
Mm. And there's no, and I'm, this isn't really about workload. If your publisher wants to do your newsletter and take that work off your, your desk, that's terrific. Then that's great. But the data has got to be yours. And so if your publisher says, oh, hey, we're, we're going to start a, a mailing list for you. This is going to be great. You're going to be able to talk to your readers. Then you need to make sure that you are the one who owns that data because I hate to say it, but you might not stay with that publisher. You might get a better offer. They might ditch you. There are lots of reasons why people move on and you do not want to be leaving that data with your old publisher. The other reason I love mailing lists is because nobody but you knows how many people are on your list. And that means you can write without feeling self-conscious So I started all of this long before I I was an author. I started when I had a blog. And so what I was publicizing was was my blog and my Facebook page was, uh, you know, there are still people on my Facebook page who came to me through my blog and have kind of grown with me and now on what is effectively an author page. And so I remember having fewer than 100 people who liked my Facebook page and thinking, oh, this is such a small number of people. I feel so kind of embarrassed making announcements on this tiny, tiny platform. And actually, you shouldn't ever feel embarrassed about a small platform because a small platform can be really engaged and focused. But the brilliant thing about email is that you can have five people on that list and one of them can be your mum, but you're still writing to four people that don't you know, aren't personally connected to you. And those four people have no idea if they're one of five or one of 5,000 which helps with the smoke and mirrors that I think authors should invoke when they're starting out. I think let's be kind of out and proud and bold about our marketing. And it's easy to do that by email. Mm, I'm so glad you say all that. We definitely agree on that. So (laughs) I want to talk about video because I was just thinking that you mentioned hostage, your flight. And I remember one of your TikToks or Instagrams or whatever, where you're dressed up and <laughs> dressed up as a, <laughs> a, an air hostess, and I'm like, oh, Claire is so good at this stuff, and like, I hate video, and I, like, we we know each other, and we're not on video right now. We're recording this audio. I just don't like doing video, and so I wanted to get your tips on. Well, first of all, why do you do video? Do you think it's effective, and how do you do it? Um, and are you just very good at it, or have you learned tips, basically? Okay, so I I don't think anyone should do anything they don't want to do. And that that applies to everything from email, I suppose, reluctantly, although I would argue that you should. Um, But certainly social media platforms, if you hate Twitter, don't do Twitter. And the same applies to video. If you hate it and it makes you uncomfortable, it is very likely to look uncomfortable as well. And that is going to be you know, it's going to have a negative effect. And often it's better to not do something than to do it badly. The reason I do video is because I think it is effective. I think people do linger over video in a way that they don't over static images and certainly in a way they don't over just text. Static based images are not so great for people with visual impairments. And so hopefully all of us are using alt text to describe what's in those images. But the beauty of video is it's it gives something for everyone. And so you can have the captions, you can have the voiceover, you can have the, the imagery. And it means that it's content that can be consumed by lots of different people in lots of different ways while they're commuting um, with their headphones. So I I really like it. I like short form video because it's quite easy. I don't have to think about it too much. Um, I am quite vain. And so I don't particularly, so I wouldn't really, I wouldn't record a lot of the natural. I don't do stories very often, for example, on Instagram, because I think the best kind of stories that people do are very sort of off the cuff going about their their daily business. And actually most of the time in my daily life, if I'm not in pajamas, I'm not far off. Uh, I haven't washed my hair. I haven't got any makeup on. I just, I don't really want to be camera ready. I'm quite hot on brand management and looking like a mess doesn't really fit my brand. So I tend to be a bit more planned and that means that I might batch film some content perhaps, or I might do something that doesn't require me to actually be talking to camera. That's one of my tips for people who are uncomfortable with video is is do a video, but you don't have to be on it. So you can use voice over a beautiful video of where you've had your dog walk. You can tell us about your, your plot walk, or you can flip through a book 
before you show us the cover while you overlay some text that tells us how great it is. All those things will work on Reels, will work on TikTok. Um, I do, I joined TikTok really because I like to try things out. And so there are lots and lots of things. You know, I joined Vine, I joined Rooms, I joined, uh, what's the audio only one that I got quite excited about? House. Yes, I joined Clubhouse. Yeah, everyone did that and then disappeared a month later. (laughs) Yeah. So I like to join at the start. I think it's important to join, to understand it, to see if that's where your readers might be, if that's where your author network might be, to claim an account name at the very least so that no one else claims it. And then just see. And TikTok is something that I thought, you know, this is clearly exploding. BookTok is exploding. It doesn't show any signs of slowing down. And although at the moment, crime and thriller and mystery are not big genres on there, there's absolutely nothing to stop them suddenly taking off. At the moment, it's very much about fantasy and romance. But all it takes really is is for a a crime book to go viral from some reader's feed. And that could easily kickstart a a big crime and, and thriller movement on TikTok. And if that happens... I'd like to have a presence. I want people to be able to tag me. I want to be able to take part. And then the other reason why I do TikTok is because it allows me to, I suppose, show a bit of personality without being personal. You know, I don't want to give you a tour of my house. I don't want to introduce you to my family, really. I've got teenagers. They certainly don't want to be introduced to anyone. (laughs) And so I want to build that personal connection with readers and actually doing that through some tongue in cheek videos is quite a fun thing to do. And yeah, I'm enjoying it. So on marketing, a lot of us as indie authors, we have almost real time access to to sales data. So we can see the immediate ROI really of of a lot of this stuff. But of course, traditionally published authors, I know there are portals and things now, but most authors don't get access to any kind of real-time sales, right? So how how do you know what what marketing is working for you? And you mentioned like brand, is it just just all going towards brand? Yeah, the bottom line is I don't know. I, I don't have that real-time ROI. It is a continual source of frustration to me and the only part of my sort of empire that doesn't work, which is really annoying in itself. So I would love to have that data. And not only do I not have it personally, it's it, it doesn't exist. It's not even like I can ask my publishers to give me that real-time data. It just can't work like that in, in the traditionally published world at the moment. So it's really frustrating. And so what I do is I think about my return, not in terms of sales, but in terms of growth. So what everything, which is why I don't advertise, for example. So I wouldn't do an advert for a book because that is not going to give me a return. Better for me would be to perhaps advertise my book club or to advertise, I don't know, from one of my social media feeds, um, running writing tips and advertise to, to writing groups. Because if I bring people into my community, then I've got a system in place for creating loyalty, for uh, engaging and creating a community who will then go on to read my books. So my return is, is community building rather than book sales. I think that's a great way to think about it. And yeah, once people come on your email list, you know they're interested. So I think that's a, a really good tip. So you mentioned their empire, which I love. And I, I love that you're ambitious. And obviously, again, you have that business background. So do you have a five-year plan, 10-year plan, uh, Claire McIntosh takes over the world type of plan? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I do. I do. I have, in fact, it probably needs updating. I think I'm at I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of at various critical points. So I do in terms of business goals. So for example, one of my goals was to become a book a year author, which I haven't been. I'm relatively slow in publishing terms. Uh, and more importantly, for me, I've been inconsistent. So my books have come out perhaps 15 months apart or 18 months or 20. or uh, And that's really difficult. It's difficult for me to plan my year. So my work-life balance is harder to um, I'm sort of laughing because I don't have a work-life balance, but <laughs> it's harder to maintain. It's harder for retailers because they can't hold a slot. If you think about expecting perhaps the Richard Osman every autumn, for example. Mm-hmm. 
So it's harder for retailers. It, it's it's not great for readers because, again, you want to build that connection so that readers know that they can take a Claire Macintosh on holiday with them every summer. So I, I decided that I would become a, a book year author. And that's been you know something we've sort of been moving towards. So that was a goal. I have goals in terms of Sunday Times top 10 and um, how long I'd like to spend in there and um, where I'd like to come. So yeah, lo- lots of goals and uh, lots of, of plans to get the balance right, which I don't have at the moment. Oh, does anyone... <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, it's hard to know, isn't it? I follow some authors that I think you have absolutely got it right. You know, you're nailing the business side. You are regularly hitting the top of the charts and you're also learning to, I don't know, paint or traveling the world. Um, so, yeah, lots to work on. Yeah. But I mean, that's partly why we do this, right? Because we like learning new things and you clearly like learning new things. And so do I. But I I know we're almost running out of time. So I do want to ask you, because you uh, have said to me that you're a staunch traditional author with no plans to go indie, which I love (laughs) because so often I just meet really ambitious indie authors and not so much traditional. And I also love you're happy with your publishing choices because, of course, there's a lot of people who aren't. Now, many listeners, you know, when I think about it sometimes too, are interested in getting a deal with an agent and traditional publisher. So what are your recommendations for authors who want to pitch, especially if they might have already released some books as an indie? Well, I think you've got a great, you're off to a really good start if you've already got a track record, because so many people will be pitching to agents with no track record. You know, we we don't know if you can finish a book even, let alone if you can publish one successfully. So if you've got a track record with um your with self-publishing, then you know that's huge, a, a great thing to to lean on. But I I mean I, I didn't pitch. This is the the thing that I find slightly awkward is that I I never submitted. I was introduced and that's an annoying story for people because it makes people think it's all about who you know but in order to make that connection in order for that introduction to happen I had done a phenomenal amount of networking within publishing having known nobody in in publishing organizing a literary festival volunteering at events speaking to people and so really my biggest bit of advice for people who are thinking of submitting through the traditional process is to get to know people is to go to literary events and do the kind of open mic type pitching or the pitch to agents um, meet people listen to authors work out who they're published by is to really really do your research because it will pay off and actually those chance connections I hear about again and again because ultimately agents are interested in in people. And if they're interested in you and you're a good writer, then you're home and dry. Yeah. And I was going to add, I'm glad you said it. You are very, very good at networking. I remember when you were doing that, it was the Chip Lit Fest, right? You used to organize that. And I was like, goodness me, I know how much it's hard work. Like I'm doing an event this weekend. It's just one day with 35 people. And you used to organize this sort of massive event and you put in far more hours, I think, preparing for those relationships than most people do in pitching for years. So... (laughs) You, you, it's not like you sat around just going, oh, I'll just meet some people. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And I mean, with the literary festival, I, I had a big, a big team of, of volunteers working with me. So I certainly didn't do it alone. But yeah, it, you do have to put the graft in, um, you know, like writing. If, if we looked at our hourly rate from writing certainly for those of us like me who write really slowly and throw away more words than we publish it it would not be worth us doing this it's a ridiculous way to make a living and the same kind of applies to networking if if I thought oh actually it took me 200 hours worth of networking in order to get a particular event for example then it wouldn't be worth it but if that networking has been going to parties, if it's been having dinner with interesting people, if it's been cocktails or a nice walk with other writers, then actually that there's a really blurred line, isn't there, between networking and just getting to know people. And I, I think that if you enjoy getting to know people, then it's not a chore. And then when the payoff comes, it feels like it's come for free. 
Yeah, because you weren't expecting it. You didn't like every day you did something go, oh, I'm expecting to get a book deal. You did it the right way. And I, I really appreciate how you've done yeah, things. And, and if you ever go into any networking opportunity with the mindset that I'm doing this in order to get this result, then it's really not going to work. It just isn't. You mm. have to go in, you know, you go to that party or take up that that coffee invitation with the intention of just finding out about someone, having fun, enjoying a, an hour or, or more. And if something comes of it, that's that's brilliant. Uh, but networking is so important and I can track things back. An opportunity, perhaps an event, perhaps a, a travel, a tra- you know, a trip abroad somewhere, I can track it back through sometimes years and through several different layers of people, friends of friends of friends of friends, uh, right back to the first meeting. And I'll think back to that first meeting and think, you know, did I envisage that what happened in the end was going to be the result from it? And I didn't, but I did have an inkling that this would be a worthwhile use of my time. Brilliant. So uh, where can people find you and your books online? Well, the advantage of being called Claire McIntosh is there aren't actually that many of us. So you can just Google me. I'm really available online. My website is clairemackintosh.com. I'm on Twitter as Claire McIntosh and everywhere else as Claire Mac writes. You can join my book club. There'll be a, a pop up on my website and I'd love to see you there. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Claire. That was great. Thank you. So I hope you found the interview with Claire interesting. I love that she takes such ownership of her marketing, even while actively choosing to license her rights to traditional publishers. We all have to choose how we run our author business and you get to make those decisions for your books. So in next week's episode, I'm talking about editing fiction and nonfiction with my editor, Kristen Tate. We talk about the different types of editing, what AI tools are good for versus human editors, common issues in fiction and non-fiction, and how to find and work with an editor. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes, available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.